Hello and welcome to Atlantic Debrief, the Atlantic Council Europe Center video and podcast show on the most pressing issues in transatlantic relations today. My name is Jan Fleck. I'm the Senior Director of the Europe Center. And today's conversation is also part of our series, Transatlantic Horizons, where we explore the implications of the election years on both sides of the Atlantic for the U.S.-European agenda moving forward. I'm delighted to have today with us Fabian Zulek, the Chief Executive Officer of the European Policy Center, a leading think tank in EU affairs in Bru- in Brussels, uh, a, a longtime partner of us at the Europe Center. Fabian, great to have you with us and in person in Washington, D.C. today. Well, thanks very much for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Looking forward to our conversation, which Today, we'll obviously focus on the European elections coming up in June. That kicks off a cycle of political transition in the European Union writ large with a new commission president, um, a new college of commissioners, a new president of the European Council as well. And all of that will sort of wrap up by by December of this year. We'll we'll explore that a little bit and what that means for the EU agenda and EU politics. Um, Obviously, there are U.S. elections here in November already having an impact on some key European policy debates. We can explore that a little bit and then look ahead what that means for the EU agenda and and also U.S.-European agenda moving forward. Uh, So to kick us off, uh, Fabian would love to jump right in and and maybe start with what you see three months out or so before the elections as the key dynamics, key trends in the European election uh, uh, dynamics, um, what you're watching most closely, what you think those watching from the United States perhaps should pay most attention to in this European election cycle. And also keeping in mind, obviously, that the European Parliament elections are only part of this much broader political transition that we will see this year at the European Union level. So what are you watching? What are you seeing on on the European elections? Yeah, I mean, certainly when we look at the European Parliament election, um, the big story everyone is watching is uh, the rise of the right uh, or the rise of the populist. Um, It's not necessarily always the case uh, that we're talking about uh, hardened uh, far-right parties, um, but very much anti-parties, parties parties which are uh, against European integration, which are not really constructive partners uh, when they get into parliament. And there uh, we are expecting quite a large increase um, from the last election. Uh, We're going to see uh, that uh, those groups become stronger in the European Parliament, and that uh, creates difficulties um, for passing uh, the legislative program of the next uh, political cycle. Uh, it won't be that they have a majority. Uh, that majority will still be in the center, um, but that majority will be reduced, um, and we're already starting to see that some of the mainstream parties are Uh, becoming more wary when it comes to certain topics, uh, in particular uh, when it comes to green, for example. Um, On top of that, it will also have an impact domestically. Uh, European elections are always also domestic elections. Um, They very much uh, reflect what the electorate thinks in different countries about their government, um, not so much about European priorities. Um, So that's always a paradox. And there uh, we're seeing that uh, certainly in some of the big countries, uh, it's politically very difficult. Germany, uh, the coalition is expected to do quite badly. Uh, There's also a fear that President Macron is not going to be very successful um, and that will have then implications for domestic politics. Um, But this is not only an election, um, this is also a big political change um, with uh, some ties to the European election, um, but uh, there's a lot which is happening uh, beyond that. Uh, we will have a new commission president, a new council president. I think that's an important question also to consider. Uh, how do these two jobs work together? Or um, 
work better together than they have uh, in the last period. Um, and we will see new priorities being set, in part by the candidates uh, for the Commission President, but also by the member states. Um, so the strategic priorities are starting to emerge now, um, and it very much reflects uh, the level of crisis, the level of challenge which we are in, um, but it also reflects uh, some thinking about uh, the transatlantic relationship and what that will mean for Europe in the coming years. Put a lot on the table there. Let's let's unpack that a little bit, um, especially with you, you mentioned the potential implications of personnel change, of uh, a shift to the right in the parliament, but also the domestic implications these elections might have in some uh, key member states. Um, and you already mentioned some emerging tensions around the agenda. If we shift to the agenda and, and look at the next political cycle, late 24 through 29, it's a five-year uh, term for the commission and the parliament. From the current debate and, and uh, um, existing dynamics, what do you see as sort of the big two or three themes emerging for the next political cycle at the EU level? Um. Firstly, I think it's uh, important uh, to always recognize that at the European level, we tend to add new priorities, but not remove any. Um, so many of the priorities which have been there um, in the last uh, cycle uh, will return, maybe not with quite as much emphasis, but they certainly will still be there. So the technological transformation, uh, the uh, green and sustainability agenda will still be there. Um, but what really has emerged now um, is, I would say, two um, new topics. Um, clearly, they have already been discussed, um, but they will be very much uh, in the limelight now. Uh, one is defense. Um, and for the first time, uh, we are seeing that uh, defense gets a, uh, a real role at the European level. Um, focused on the defense industry, um, but still uh, it is a very different approach uh, than in the past. Uh, and von der Leyen has uh, already said that if she becomes commission president again, there will be a defense commissioner. Um, so that's a big change uh, in the system. The other area where there's a lot of concern is competitiveness, uh, the economic performance of the European Union. Uh, also in its ability to deal with all of these crises uh, which we're facing uh, and their competitiveness of European industry um, and uh, the legislative burden uh, will be very much on the agenda. So two two big themes there. Um, the the shift that you described, the potential shift in in the European Parliament and the new options that some traditional players like the EPP, the center-right group, might have uh, in that new scenario. How do you see that impacting, for example, the competitiveness debate, but you also mentioned in your first comments the sort of backlash against uh, uh, the the burden of green transition and that not being uh, um, um, coped with, with too well. How do you see that dynamic playing out? I think part of the effect uh, will be a tendency uh, to do uh, less through the legislative route. Um, it will be more difficult uh, to get uh, the, the um, big legal packages through if they are in controversial areas. Uh, it will be harder to construct that pro-European uh, majority. Um, so I think the tendency will be uh, to try to use the frameworks which are already there as much as possible so much more implementation, much more enforcement, and much more executive action. Um, using things like the budget, for example, where, yes, you still have to get it through the parliament at some point, um, but then after it is passed, it gives you some freedom um, to, to act. Um, but the problem with executive action at the European level is that the member states have to allow it. Um, and this is far from clear where the member states are happy with the commission taking a much more proactive rule. Uh, I think this is actually why the commission president um, is only part of the puzzle. It's the council president as well. Um, if those two work together well, that can help to ease that process between the member states and the EU institutions. Um. 
you you already mentioned defense and security as a as a key and the the idea of a defense commissioner. What role would that defense commissioner play? And isn't this much more of a defense industrial commissioner in in many ways? And and what scope and and potential for the EU to take a much stronger role in that? Do you see? Um, the defense commissioner will have to act within the competences of the European Union. So. It is not a defense minister. Um, there is no European army uh, which will be directed at the European level. This is very much about coordinating what happens between the different countries. Um, and there, uh, in particular, the question of the defense sector, uh, the industry in Europe, um, is uh, really what uh, I would say is a pressing need um, because there has to be a reorganization of the European defense sector. Um, Europe actually um, spends too little on defense, um, but even more importantly, it's extremely inefficient in the way it spends on defense with a lot of fragmentation and duplication. So to have a defense commission who can address this uh, would be in principle um, a very helpful um, uh, new innovation um, if Uh, they have the power to then also intervene in what in the end is still national industry. And um, in, in terms of the longer term ambition of stepping up in the defense area, what do you see as the key, key steps or key obstacles here? I think a lot will be driven from the outside. Um, and the question um, is very much what happens uh, in the election on this side of the Atlantic. Um, if we do have uh, a Trump presidency again, um, then I think there will be pressure on Europeans to take more responsibility for defense, not only spending more, certainly that will be part of it, but also um, being much more active uh, in the own neighborhood. Um, but there's also a big danger that uh, in that circumstance we see a fragmentation. Um, so that rather than doing it together at the European level, we go back to very much a national approach, which we know is very ineffective, um, but maybe politically is easier. Um, you already mentioned, you already brought us back to the back to the US side and the, the impact of the US elections on key European debates, such as support for Ukraine, European defense. Uh, there's been a lot of talking about preparing for Europe to stand alone or fireproofing the transatlantic partnership. What, what can, what should Europe do in that respect? And what options does Europe have to, uh, to prepare itself for a potential, uh, Trump to administration that would be generally expected to have a negative impact on, on us commitments to European security. I think this is um, very much uh, a question of polarized uncertainty. Um, we have two very different outcomes and uh, I'm not going to speculate which one it is going to be um, because I think it's also very difficult uh, to tell. Um, so if we have a Biden II uh, administration, I think generally speaking, uh, that would be far preferred uh, by Europeans. Uh, but it doesn't solve all the problems in the transatlantic relationship. And I think there are many discussions which still need to be had. Um, yes, on European side as well about increasing capability, taking more responsibility for defense and security. Um, that isn't dependent on Trump being in the White House. Uh, that is also something which would have to be addressed if Biden is in the White House. Um, but also about trade, uh, about uh, some of the areas of friction um, where we're seeing that domestic policies on both sides of the Atlantic plays into the relationship um, and makes it more difficult. Um, but Trump too um, is uh, from a European pers uh, perspective a catastrophe uh, because it doesn't only uh, address the economic relationship, it doesn't only address Uh, these kind of um, long-term uh, demands from the U.S., but it puts directly into question the security architecture of Europe and uh, whether Ukraine will be continued to be supported. Um, and this 
uh, is a major uh, issue for Europeans. Um, there is a real fear that um, the um, Trump II administration would be um, the end of NATO, uh, the end uh, of uh, the core component of the transatlantic relations. Um, so the the European leaders are well versed in in dealing with catastrophes and crises. You describe uh, this as a perma crisis with with some colleagues some years ago. Um, looking maybe at, at trying to figure out a way forward. If there's a Trump two administration, even with those challenges, do you see any positioning, posturing from the European side, from the EU side, to build some sort of positive agenda with with such an administration? And where would be some of those smaller openings? Um, I, I think there are some areas um, where essentially the Europeans can offer Trump um, victories. Um, and I think that uh, would have to be also considered from a political perspective, um, even if it might be distasteful. Um, but the real difficulty is um, that when it comes to Ukraine, uh, this is playing with fire. Um, and anything which discourages Ukraine, encourages Putin, um, encourages him to also test uh, the Europeans. So I think the main uh, response from Europe, uh, if it comes to that, uh, would have to be uh, a common approach, uh, particularly to defense and security. Um, but we will also see that uh, Trump II administration will lead to fragmentation. Um, some countries will try to accommodate more than others. Um, so there's also a danger in Europe not acting together, but uh, fragmenting even further. Well, Fabian, thank you so much for, for your perspectives here. We will continue that conversation with you and your colleagues at the European Policy Center, I hope. Thank you to our viewers for joining us. Watch out for more content from Atlantic Debrief, but also our Transatlantic Horizons series where we look at the elections on both sides of the Atlantic and especially their implications for the Transatlantic Partnership. Thank you for joining us. Watch out for more and hope to have you back soon, Fabian. Thank you. Thank you.